Hello, my name is Tanya Caprillion, and I'm one of our radiation oncologists at UCLA. Um, I actually head the uh, brain and spine tumor division in our department, and I'm happy to be here today to talk to you about radiation therapy for brain tumors. What is a brain tumor? Primary brain tumors consist of both benign and malignant tumors. Meningiomas, gliomas, which can be broken down to astrocytoma, oligodendroglioma, and glioblastoma. And then there are pituitary adenomas, acoustic schwannomas, CNS lymphomas, to name a few. There are secondary brain tumors, which are tumors that have spread from another site in the body to the brain, and these are called metastases. The brain anatomy is very important when we de determine uh, what symptoms a patient might have uh, from a brain tumor, whether it be a primary brain tumor or a secondary brain tumor. And these are the different lobes um, or sections uh, in the brain. You have the frontal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, occipital lobe. Um, and you can see that there are different areas that control motor and sensory. Speech or aphasia or difficulties with speech uh, can develop if there is a tumor or mass in Broca's area, which is the dominant frontal lobe in a patient. Um, this is also an area that controls motor and uh, it will affect a patient's expression of speech. So it's an, an expressive aphasia. They have difficulty uh, speaking. Wernicke's area is in the dominant temporal lobe. Um, and this is the area of the brain that controls sensation. And this would be a receptive aphasia where a patient would have difficulties understanding what someone would be telling them. Then there's the inner brain anatomy. So this is basically looking at the entire brain uh, sliced through the middle um, and looking inside. And you can see that there are different um, components of the brain um, in this view. And these are all uh, taken in, into um, consideration when we're doing a radiation treatment plan. The homunculus is a map uh, of basically a, a portion of the brain uh, controlling a portion of the body. Um, and you can see how here it's kind it's mapped out for us where we can see that in a, a specific portion of the brain, there's a small section that would control the foot, hip, trunk, arm, hand, face, tongue, larynx. So it's very, it's really this intricate um, in the brain. And this is um, why patients might have specific symptoms. Um, and this is how we counsel patients when we do uh, our radiation uh, treatments. What is a glioma? Gliomas consist of astrocytoma, oligodendroglioma, and glioblastoma. And here you can see a picture um, of, a, of dendrites, a, a nucleus of a cell, and you can see an astrocyte uh, or a glial cell and an oligodendrocyte, another type of glial cells. Um, so this is just kind of one view of this is a neuron and you can see the astrocytes and oligodendrocytes attaching to it. And here's another image of a glial cell, whether it be an astrocyte or an oligodendrocyte. How does cancer develop? It starts with a DNA mutation. So you have loss of normal growth control. And then that cancer cell division continues. So you have a first mutation, a second mutation, a third mutation, and the and then a fourth mutation and so on. And then you have uncontrolled growth because you have cell damage with no repair mechanism. Typically when you have cell damage, you would have a, either a repair mechanism or the cell would die. But in cancer, it continues to divide. Here is what an image of a normal brain cell pathology slide would look like. You can see how it's all organized. It's the image to your left. Um, and defined, whereas a glioblastoma, you can see that it looks more chaotic on the slide. Um, and you can, there's more cell division, there are more cells. Um, so this is just kind of a, a screenshot uh, of a difference between normal versus a, a tumor a pathology slide. The MRIs are very helpful. Um, here is an MRI of a patient with a glioblastoma. It is a uh, sliced three different ways, axial, coronal, and sagittal. The axial slices, uh, basically imagine the brain cut from the top to the bottom. Um, the coronal slices, imagine the, the cut is from the front to the back, and the sagittal is the side uh, cut from one side to the other. Here you can see on the MRI um, with contrast, um, a, an area in the brain uh, where you can see an abnormal lesion uh, or what we presume to be a tumor. 
you can see it both uh, actually all three ways axial coronal and sagittal and these are all important for us um, when we're um, examining and evaluating patients what are some common presenting symptoms well as i mentioned uh, already it depends on the location of the tumor so these can vary not every patient will have every symptom some patients will have no symptoms so headache seizures are common potentially motor weakness or sensory deficit depending on if the tumor is located at, the, at those areas speech difficulties nausea vomiting or unsteadiness what is edema so Oftentimes, accompanying uh, these tumors is swelling or edema or inflammation. Um, and we can typically see these uh, with a uh, T2 sequence of an MRI. So here you can see an, a cartoon image of a patient uh, with the brain being shown. And this is a slice from the front. Um, you can see the tumor and then you can see the surrounding inflammation in red. So here you can see patient one with two images. You have the first image with a T2 sequence and it looks inflamed and you can see the swelling, that white is the edema or the swelling. And on the T1 contrast, you actually, it's harder to see, you almost don't see anything. For patient two, you see a lot more of that edema or inflammation. And then with the T1 contrast, you actually see the lesion now. So the difference between the image of patient one and the image of patient two is that the image of patient one fits the profile more of a low-grade glioma, whereas the image of patient two fits the profile of a higher-grade glioma. The initial treatments, uh, treatment for a patient with a primary brain tumor or a glioma um, in this uh, discussion, um, are, uh, are the treatment of the symptoms um, include steroids to decrease that inflammation. Oftentimes the, the symptoms are from the inflammation itself. And so with steroids or Decadron, we can decrease that inflammation and allow some relief um, and then dissipate some of the symptoms. Anti-seizure medications such as Keppra and Zylantin may also be useful if a patient presents with seizures or is at risk for developing them. What are some causes of brain tumors? We know some uh, causes. Prior radiation therapy to the brain is a known cause. For example, a child that required, um, let's say, whole brain radiation for a leukemia diagnosis may grow up to develop um, a primary brain tumor, oftentimes a meningioma, or what we would call a radiation-induced meningioma. These would take 20 to 30 years to develop. I also counsel my patients that radiation not only it cures tumors or treats tumors, but they can lead to cancer in the setting that I just described. However, when you use it in the therapeutic setting in an adult, it's very rare uh, to develop a, another brain tumor from the radiation that was given for that initial uh, tumor. It really does take a long time and you really do need a large area that was treated. Genetics can also play a role. Neurofibromatosis, von Hippel-Lindau, tuberous sclerosis, and Lee Fermani are some syndromes to name a few. There are possible causes associated with weakened immunity or hormonal effects. And then there are unclear causes, hair dye, power lines, cell phones, polyvinyl chloride. We read about these in the media um, and there's more and more studies being done on some of these, such as the cell phones, to come to a, a more definitive conclusion. And of course, there are many unknown factors. The most common uh, brain tumor are actually metastases, those that spread from another site. But the most common primary malignant brain tumor in adults is a glioblastoma. You can see that gliomas consist of 40% of primary brain tumors, meningiomas following uh, at 30%. In the incidence of gliomas, you can see that adult, in adults, uh, gliomas, um, approximately 80% are high grade and approximately 20% are low grade. And what you see here is about 50% um, are the grade four uh, glioblastoma. How do we diagnose a brain tumor? The MRI is a first step. We use with and without contrast, as I showed in images prior, and then surgery, either biopsy or a subtotal resection, which would be an incomplete resection, a near total resection, or a gross total resection, which would be a complete resection. And now what are the treatments of, a, a, of an astrocytoma or a glioblastoma? First, we start with maximal surgery. And then we uh, follow it with adjuvant therapy or post-surgery uh, treatments such as chemotherapy using Timidar, 
or other agents or and uh, radiation therapy. So I'll be focusing in on the radiation therapy. Why do we need radiation? So the radiation causes tumor DNA damage. The way it works is the radiation hits a water molecule in the body, creates a free radical or an oxidant, and then directly damages the DNA. That's the indirect pathway. The direct pathway is that the radiation itself would damage the DNA. But in our mechanism, what we're doing when we deliver radiation therapy is this indirect route. Um, and this is why um, I advise my patients during the course of the radiation therapy to avoid using antioxidants and they can resume it afterwards. But here the oxidants are helping us destroy the DNA of the tumor cells. So how and why do the normal brain cells survive? That is why we actually fractionate the radiation dose. And that means we give daily small doses for a total large dose. This fractionation allows the DNA of normal tissues time to repair because they have the repair mechanism, whereas the cancer cells do not and they die off. One large dose of radiation, which we define as radiosurgery, can be given only when you have a small target and you'll add minimal to no margin around that target or tumor so as to spare any normal brain around there. And this uh, causes a pretty immediate uh, cell death of, of the tumor. And that's why you don't want really any normal brain um, in that area that you're treating and you only do radio surgery for very focused, small uh, tumors. There are several options with radiation therapy. There's 3D conformal, uh, and that's uh, more of the historic uh, treatment modality. In this newer era, particularly for primary brain tumors that can be located next to critical structures, we use IMRT or intensity modulated radiation therapy. IMRT can come in three forms um, or at least three forms, multiple fields where the beams come from different angles, rapid arc where the beams are literally arc shaped, either they could be a quarter arc, a half arc, a full arc, um, or circle, and then tomotherapy, which is circular rotation of the radiation field around the target. Then you have protons, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, um, particularly um, as you look up things on the internet or even see billboards. Um, and this is coming into play more as more proton centers open up around the world. And then there's radio surgery, which is essentially very focused radiation that's delivered still externally um, on the target. And you have different um, machines that can deliver radio surgery. Gamma knife is the first machine that was created to deliver radio surgery. So oftentimes the word gamma knife is used interchangeably with radio surgery, but it's actually just the brand name of the machine. You can deliver radio surgery also with a linear accelerator based system, a LINAC based radio surgery machine, which is what we have here at UCLA, and also the cyber knife. So what goes into the radiation planning? So the first step is the MRI. We ask the patients to get a new MRI that is a couple of weeks post their uh, surgery. Um, and, and that will allow the brain to have uh, rest and healed from the surgery and, and settled. Uh, and we can use that for our, our planning and, and contouring of, of the area we want to target. We also need a CT simulation. At that time, we do a CT scan and we make this plastic mask that you see. Um, it's conformed to the patient's face and head, so it's unique to that patient. It's used to hold the patient's head down on the treatment table so that they don't move when we do the radiation because we wanna be within one millimeter of accuracy. So once we have those two things, uh, it takes us about five days, but five business days to get a plan ready. The physicist will then fuse the CT to that MRI. And then the physician would contour on the MRI because we can see things a lot better. And it transfers over to the CT scan, which is what the treatment machine recognizes. And here you can see uh, the fusion process. We make sure, of course, that it's aligned uh, very accurately. Uh, before we start uh, the contouring or drawing process. So here you can see that the CT on the right has been fused to the CT on the left. Um, the tumor was drawn on the MRI. It was then uh, overlaid onto the CT. And then what you see on the CT, those lines, those are the radiation isodose lines or the radiation um, basically dose lines. Um, and you can see how it's 
hugging the target. The red is your prescription dose. And as you fall off from the red, it gets lower and lower dose. So that's just the spillage dose. The purple is actually quite a, a low dose and clinically insignificant. So what the physician uh, contours is not only the tumor, but also the normal structures in the brain. And that's very important because when we draw the normal structures, such as the eyes um, and the eye nerves, we're drawing them out so that we can avoid them as much as we can. Each structure in the brain has its own tolerance of how much radiation it can take or tolerate. And we would never exceed those internationally accepted tolerance um, criteria and numbers. Um, so we're very careful. So we uh, draw those out, but we also, of course, draw out the brain tumor or the resection cavity, the surgical resection cavity. We label this the GTV or gross tumor volume. We then add an appropriate margin to the tumor for any microscopic disease that's not seen. And that's the CTV or clinical target volume. So I, the way I describe it to my patients is picture a glioma like an octopus where you have the head of the octopus um, as the tumor that we see. And then the tentacles is what we don't see. And that's why we draw a margin to make sure that we include those tentacles and we don't miss any tumor. Then we also add a very small margin within millimeters uh, for motion or setup changes. And that's called the planning target volume. The clinical target volume is, is typically defined uh, in papers and studies and textbooks based on the patient's diagnosis and the grade of the tumor. So then the physics team plans according to the physician's specifications. We give the dose we want to the tumor, uh, and then we give the doses that are accepted for the normal structures. The physician then has to approve, perhaps even fine tune the plan before it's ready. And then once it's ready and signed, um, then the phys physicist then takes it back and does some quality checks to make sure it's spot on. And then the patient is ready for treatment. And this is why it takes us a few days to get the plan ready. So what we look at when we're an analyzing a plan is the dose to the tumor versus dose constraints for the normal structures such as the eyes, ears, nerves, normal brain. So here you can see a, a plan um, and you can see it in a um, uh, uh, the isodose lines um, in a, a few different views. And basically what you're looking at um, is the, uh, the dose volume histogram. And each structure you can see in the DVH legend um, has its unique color. And basically you map it on then the histogram and you make sure it doesn't exceed any of the tolerances that you listed um, or criteria for the tolerances that you listed and specified for the physicist. So you make sure those are acceptable and then you look at how the coverage is of the tumor itself. So um, here is looking at uh, an example of IMRT in three different ways of, of giving it. So as I mentioned, you can have seven field IMRT where the beams come in from different angles. And then there's arc therapy where it's an actual arc that delivers uh, the radiation to the target. And then tomotherapy is actually a circular mot uh, rotation of the radiation around the target. And that is um, useful to use in things that are cylindrical such as, uh, for example, the spine or spinal column. So uh, here is basically how then a physician would analyze the plan. So you have a 3D plan on top, you have an IMRT um, traditional uh, multi-beam plan and multi-field plan, and then you have the rapid arc, the arc system that I mentioned. Um, and you wanna basically take a look and, and see which one is better. And um, in the image on the left, uh, what you can see with the 3D is it's spilling a lot of low dose. Um, you really want that red to be right where your tumor is, and then you want uh, the, the blue and the other colors to be um, uh, much less. So you, you see that it's spilling a lot of low dose, but you also see that the redness isn't so hot um, or, or so confined to that actual target. And so I would probably not pick that plan. So then looking at the two uh, um, more intricate plans, the IMRT traditional uh, multiple beam and the rapid arc, what I would compare is um, the spillage um, and also the dose that's getting to the tumor. So what you can see is the red is really conformed to that target and it's, it's much more red with the multi-beam IMRT. 
that's great. So, so far, uh, you know, that's one point there. But the other more important point is, as you can see on the side view, the blue spillage is a lot less for the one labeled IMRT. So I would pick um, this plan amongst the three, one looking at the coverage of the tumor being excellent, and then two looking at the spillage being less. So then looking at another, uh, to, uh, another comparison here uh, on the right is an IMRT plan, comparing it to a 3D plan. The red is your target. The blue line is your prescription dose. And you want that hugging uh, essentially your tumor as best as possible. And you can see that the IMRT is hugging a lot better than the 3D plan, it's close. So spilling less hot, hot dose out to the normal brain. Um, but the, what the 3D is also doing is it's spilling a lot more low dose out. So um, the IMRT plan that spills less hot dose out and less low dose out is the plan that we would want to pick. And here's another comparison. You can um, look at tomotherapy versus arc therapy, for example. And um, here, this is looking at the comparison in the histogram view. So what we're looking at here is the coverage. That's the PTV. You can see that the dashed and the solid line are about the same. So coverage is, is almost equivalent. But when you look at the normal structure coverage, you can see that there is a significant difference here. So the brain stem is getting a lot more dose with the solid line little less with the thicker dashed line and a lot less with this dotted dashed line. Um, and same with the eye nerve, the optical nerve. It's, so the, the, the dash, the, the smaller dashed line is the one that we would want to pick with regards to less dose going to the normal structures, but almost equivalent dose going to the tumor. This is an image of the multi-leaf collimator. This is um, in the head of the gantry that moves around the patient as the treatment is delivered. So these finger-like projections that you see actually move in and out as the radiation is being delivered. Um, and that's useful and that's how it shapes, um, essentially shapes the, um, the field according to the tumor and the plan that we have um, developed. So what are the different machines you might read about? There's the Novalis, which we have here. It delivers IMRT, rapid arc, radiosurgery. There's the tomotherapy, which we have here as well. And that's the one that delivers the circular 360 degree radiation. And there's many other machines that you'll read about. The most important thing is the machines are, are, are great, but you also wanna make sure that the users know how to use the machine. And so the, the main question you would wanna ask is the experience of the physician and physicist using the machines. Next, I would like to show you a video of the multi-leaf collimators. And this is how you can see the finger-like projections moving in and out, um, shaping to uh, the actual tumor itself. And here is the treatment delivery. And you can see that the machine moves around the patient. It images the patient. And then it delivers the radiation. And then essentially it moves the patient to a different angle, sets the patient up images again, and delivers from the other side. And this continues until the treatment plan is finished. And each day the treatment is the same. So just briefly about proton therapy, um, it's useful for some pediatric tumors. It's useful for chordomas in brain uh, requiring a very high dose next to a critical structure, often the optic nerve. The benefit of protons is that it has a very sharp fall off. It's called the Bragg peak effect. And essentially it doesn't scatter as much dose to the critical structures nearby. And so that's why proton therapy can be useful. So who does the patient's team consist of? The physician, which includes the attending physician and resident physician, the nurse practitioner or nurse, 
radiation therapists who are actually the ones who put the patient on the treatment table and deliver the radiation daily, the physicists and dosimetrists who are behind the scenes helping with the treatment plan. Uh, treatment days are uh, fractionated, typically 28 to 33 consecutive days, um, except not weekends or holidays uh, for brain tumors, depending on the diagnosis. Um, and here you can see just kind of a, a rough uh, map out of uh, a calendar for a patient, uh, for, for example, in May and June. Um, and, and blue are the days of treatment and red are the weekends on a holiday on, the, uh, on a Memorial Day, for example. Prior to treatment, the physics team does several quality assurance checks, as I mentioned. And the first day of treatment, the physician checks set up with the radiation therapist team in the treatment room. So uh, this is critical. And then the physician uh, checks daily images for setup to make sure that the alignment is correct, but we don't see uh, the actual tumor itself until an MRI is done after the completion of therapy. So this is the daily image uh, guidance that we check both the therapist and the physician daily. Here is one type of way of doing it where you overlay and you can use a box to see the day of planning CT to the day of treatment x-ray and, and uh, match them. Or you could do like a side by side, either film to x-ray to x-ray or x-ray to uh, CT generated uh, film image, uh, making sure that the uh, basically the graticules line up correctly. The physician will see the patient at least once a week on an on-treatment visit uh, to make sure that things are going well, we review any problems, answer any questions or concerns, but the physician and nurses are available daily um, if and when needed. Uh, so some acute side effects that a patient can experience during treatment, a hair loss only in the treatment field, um, not the whole head. So it might be an arc shape if it's uh, an arc delivery treatment or a beam patch distribution like the whole uh, kind of side or main area where we're treating. The hair typically regrows in three to six months, but in some cases it may not regrow grow or only partially regrows. Skin might get a little irritated, a little red or dry. We just tell the patients to protect the area from the sun and not to use any creams. We would uh, give creams to use as needed. We want the area of the skin clean before any radiation is delivered. Fatigue typically kicks in uh, around week three and progressively incre uh, increases until we finish. And then it resolves typically approximately two weeks after the radiation therapy ends. Um, the uh, hair loss also typically uh, occurs around the end of week three. Symptoms can, are typically related to inflammation from radiation that might cause or increase swelling or edema. So there could be temporary development of symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, or headache, temporary worsening of symptoms that are already present. Patient may require steroids or an increased uh, dose of the steroids, and they may, may require an increase in anti-seizure medications. Um, we would monitor that closely with our neuro-oncology colleagues. Late side effects of radiation therapy uh, can be, uh, again, continued from the swelling and edema, may, might still require steroids, and in rare situations may require surgery. Um, and this is for a, a, an entity called radiation necrosis. Basically, it's inflammation of the dead cells caused uh, by the radiation killing the tumor, um, but then sometimes the body doesn't clear out those dead cells well enough and we need to intervene with steroids and or surgery. Side effects, just like the location of the tumor, just like the symptoms of the tumor depends on the location of the tumor and radiation field. Hearing loss, uh, if the radiation is near the hearing canal, um, endocrine abnormalities, cataract development, worsening of short-term memory, cognitive decline, meaning decreased new learning ability and problem solving skills, but the patient is still fully functional, recognizes people, um, can still be communicative, can still work and function. Um, so again, the side effects are related to the location of the tumor and thus radiation. 4PI is a um, modality uh, that we uh, was invented here by one of our physicists. And essentially, um, this allows us to mimic essentially what a proton therapy could do. And the reason why there are few proton centers around the world is that it's very costly and you need a large area of land to have one. So um, a lot of people have developed ways to circumvent that and still give patients um, 
a, a delivery of a, of a radiation treatment plan that could be quite similar. So for example, glioblastomas that um, have been radiated before to a good significant dose um, might come back, or if and when they come back, we can consider repeat radiation therapy if we have a radiation treatment modality that can limit the dose that scatters to the nearby structures. So um, this is often the question in, in cases with the glioblastoma coming back. Um, most of the failures are usually within two centimeters from the primary site, and they're typically within the prior high dose region. So what our studies um, have shown here at UCLA is that 4 pi radiotherapy can significantly reduce the spillage to the normal tissues, lowering the, the, the integral dose overall. You can see the spillage is a lot less compared to um, IMRT or VMAP plants. The delivery takes a lot longer, um, but it's necessary in these uh, situations um, where you've already, uh, the patient's already had prior radiation therapy. So here's another example of a, a patient who develop, redeveloped their glioblastoma uh, in a focused area. So we developed a plan to re-radiate and you can see um, this is the four pi plan and this structure here in orange is the uh, brainstem, which is very critical and you wanna minimize the dose there. So you can see in the traditional plan, you're getting a lot more spillage into the brainstem, whereas with the four pi, you're able to spare the brainstem and thus you're able to more comfortably and confidently deliver this treatment plan without as much risk for side effect. So we did this feasibility study and basically, um, it showed that the feasibility, safety, and dosimetric benefits of 4-pi radiotherapy were clinically demonstrated with our prospective clinical trial. The results paved the way for clinical implementation of 4-pi radio, radiotherapy in many more cases with more, um, even more challenging um, physics or dosimetric requirements. So in summary, the patient's team consists of neurosurgery, neuro-oncology, radiation oncology, and the goals of treatment are cure, prolong life, increase quality of life, and minimize side effects. Thank you.